Old Testament lesson for this, the first Sunday after Pentecost, and for the Holy Trinity Sunday is from the book of Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, beginning the fourth verse. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
couple weeks ago concerning love. Satan's not anti-love. He loves when people love. When they love the wrong thing or they love the right thing in the wrong way, it's a similar thing to being religious. Satan loves whenever people are zealously religious for a religion of works righteousness. He loves it. He loves whenever people are zealously religious for a religion that rejects or confuses the two natures of Christ. He loves it. He also loves whenever people are zealously religious for a religion that rejects or confuses the Holy Trinity. He loves those things. And it's common. It's common not, in the, not even in the time of the early church, as whenever the creeds were written, but even common today for religions, institutionalized sort of teachings to confuse, to reject, especially these two great mysteries of the faith that we just confessed a moment ago. The mystery of the Holy Trinity and the mystery of the two natures of Christ, both of which are found there in the beautiful Athanasian Creed. It's good for us to say it. Both of those things are found there, and both of those things can be applied to reject not only the heresies, the false teachings of that time, but also false teachings of today. Take, for example, the Muhammadans. I don't like calling it Islam because Islam means to submit to God's will, and not submitting to God's will. But the Muhammadans, they have a, if you read the Quran, they believe certain things about the person and work of Christ, namely that he is not God. In the same way, modern Jews today, which are not biblical Jews, for modern Jews are born out of Pharisaical Judaism in the diaspora. That's a story for another time. But Jews today, they also say something about the person and work of Christ, namely that he's a rogue prophet. And they say dirty things about the Blessed Virgin Mary. You can go read about those things in the Talmud. These two groups, along with others such as Jehovah's Witnesses, such as Mormons, and even some strict Calvinists, they confuse the person of Christ, being fully God and fully man. There are other groups today, it seems to be a, a common sort of mark of cults to not only confuse the person of Christ, but also reject the divinity of the Holy Spirit. You also have groups that confuse the person in the work of the Father. We're going to talk about some of these things. We're going to talk about today this Holy Trinity, this mystery. Even though you cannot find the word, you'll hear this probably said sometimes by people that sort of are jabbing at you, that, well, the Trinity, that term, is not found in the Bible. It's true. Go online, do a word search, type in Trinity, you will not find it there, but it's a term that the church has used, it's a good term, we should keep it, a term that the church has used to describe this great mystery, this biblical reality. It's a term we use to confess, to confess this biblical reality, this reality that, not, that cannot be satisfied by empirical, reasonable, sort of scientific investigation. It must simply be confessed. And we must confess it. We must confess both the Trinity, this mystery, and also confess the mystery of Christ being fully God and fully man. We must confess thus, as we said, in order to be saved, lest we receive eternal damnation. So it behooves us today to contemplate, to meditate upon the Holy Trinity to contemplate and meditate upon Christ's two natures, not only for some sort of intellectual exercise, but in order to derive not only faith and understanding of what we should confess about God, but also comfort. Comfort in who He is and what He has done for us. So in this Trinity, it is one God, one essence, yet three Persons. It's been the same from 
eternity. And you can see, even see it in the Old Testament, even though you kind of see it dimly, it's there. This singularity yet plurality mystery of God, you can see it all the way back in Genesis. There in the beginning was God. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the deep. And the Word of God was present. And John says, of course, as we all know, the Word was in the beginning, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All three persons there in the first few verses of the Bible. It's not only there in Genesis, but also in the creation account, especially the creation of man. God says, let us make man in our image. You can see the sort of singularity, yet plurality, mystery of God, and you can even see it in our Old Testament text today. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord, is one. Now these things, like I said, they're kind of seen, dim, seen dimly in the Old Testament. They are revealed clearly in the New. Especially at Jesus' <coughs> baptism. Remember, there was John the Baptist, the forerunner of the faith, there in the Jordan River. And here comes the Word in flesh, God incarnate to him to be baptized. And when he's in the River Jordan being baptized, what happens? Heavens are torn apart. The Holy Spirit descends upon him in the likeness of a, of a dove. And the Father. The Father preaches concerning his Son in the waters. Behold, my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. All three persons are there at the same time. So it's not as though God just wears different hat or mask at different times, appearing in different ways. It's not like how I am a husband and a father and a vicar. It's not like that. But rather, he is one God, yet three persons in this mystery. And it's seen, it's revealed to us clearly, especially in the baptism of our Lord, and also in the institution of Christian baptism. All the way at the end of Matthew, you had to memorize it at some point, or at least we confess it here on Catechetical Sundays in baptism. We confess it because our dear Lord said to baptize in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. He repeats these prepositional phrases, testify to them being co-equal and co-eternal. Now, there's three persons. The first person of the Godhead is, of course, the Father. He is eternal and from eternity. He is begetting the Son. He does not create the Son. He begets Him. What's the difference? Well, I can create pancakes. I do. They're delicious. I can create pancakes. I don't beget pancakes. I have begotten my daughters. What's the difference there? Well, pancakes are humans. They're not of my same nature. But the Father and the Son, they are of the same nature, both being God. So He has from eternity been begetting the Son and has begotten the Son in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And the Father, of course, is uncreated. He is uncreated, but He is God alone. He does not possess a human nature. Only the Son produces, only the Son possesses a human nature. Nature. And for this reason, as we also say on Catechetical Sundays, the Father did not die for you, but the Son. For the Son only possesses this human nature. The Son, the second person of the Godhead, He is fully God and fully man. This is not to say 50% God and 50% man, but 100% and 100%. The mathematical computations doesn't work out. It's a mystery, him being fully God and fully man. That God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, has assumed a human nature in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary when he was conceived in her womb by the Holy Spirit. It's not as though Mary already had a baby in her womb. I know I don't have one. 
But it's not as though Mary had a baby in her womb that then God came down and sort of possessed this baby. No. And it's not as though God took a body from heaven and put it in the womb. No. He was conceived. Just like we confess. He was conceived there in her womb. And as a man, he took on the form of a servant. And he didn't, just as Paul says, he didn't consider equality with God to be something grass. Why? Because he himself is God. He possesses that divine nature even in this form of a servant. Even in his state of humiliation. And he asserts, he asserts that he is God, despite what the Jews and the Muhammadans and the Jehovah's Witnesses may say, he asserts it, not only in word, but also in deed. Of course, we have John in the prologue, and the beginning was the word, and the word was God. We have that. That's true. We also have Jesus in John 8. You guys remember this? Whenever he says, before Abraham was, I am and what did the Jews do? What did the Pharisees do? They picked up stones to stone him. Why? Because they knew he was blasphemy. They knew he was claiming to be Yahweh. Remember Moses? Moses in the burning bush. Who should I say sent me? Say, I am sent you. Jesus was claiming he was asserting in his word to be God, and he does elsewhere. But he also asserts it by his deeds. He turns water into wine. This is what Nicodemus says. Certainly you are from God. And little did he know he was actually talking to God in flesh. Something he later on repents of and realizes. He asserts it in his deeds. His great acts over creation of casting out demons. Calming the storm. He also accepts worship. If he was simply a prophet, like some of these sects claim, if he was simply a prophet, then he would not accept worship for every prophet. For God knows that you do not worship him. You worship God alone, yet Christ, God in flesh, does accept worship. The Magi, those Gentiles, come to him. They give their gifts, and they prostrate themselves. They worship him. We just celebrated Ascension, but ten or so days ago. And what did the disciples do after they witnessed the Lord ascend? What does Luke say? That they worshipped Him. And He accepted this worship. Rightfully so, because this is not simply just a prophet, but this is God in flesh. He not only asserts that He is God, but also that He is man. That this word, as John says, was God. This word became flesh and dwelt among us. He has a human genealogy. Don't skip over in the Gospels whenever you read the genealogy. The Holy Spirit inspired them for a reason. And one of the reasons is to testify to you his humanity. You can track his human descent all the way back to Adam, as Luke does. He has a human name. He has human emotions. He weeps over his beloved friend, Lazarus. He has human desires. He says on the cross, I thirst. And he even sleeps. Yes, but soundly in a boat in a storm. He does these human things because he is, in fact, human. He has this human nature, and it's according to his human nature. These things have occurred, that he has <laughs> suffered and died and is buried, descended and rose again. And only the second person of the Holy Trinity has this human nature for the Holy Spirit. The third person of the Godhead does not have this human nature. The Holy Spirit did not die for you, for he is God alone. And this Holy Spirit is not begotten like the Son, but He is proceeding. Proceeding from both the Father and the Son. For the Scriptures testify that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of both the Father 
and the Son. The Scriptures call Him the Father Spirit in Matthew 10 and the Son Spirit in Galatians 4 and Mark 3 and elsewhere. And this is why, of course, this is why the Holy Spirit proceeds from Jesus' mouth. In John 20, whenever the disciples are locked away in the upper room, scared for fear of the Jews, Jesus appears to him, to them. He proclaims peace, but then he breathes on them. And he says, receive the Holy Spirit. It proceeds from the Son, just as he proceeds from the Father from eternity. So it is good. It is good for us to reflect upon these things, these two mysteries, not only to give us the words to confess, not only to refute error, but also to derive comfort. Because when we contemplate, when we meditate upon this mystery of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this mystery of fully God and fully man, it gives to us a greater understanding of how these things were necessary not only for the salvation of the world, but for your salvation. That when you look at God sending forth His Son to take on our human flesh, as the Father offers up His Son in love, and the Son willingly offers Himself for love, out of love for His Father, out of love for the world, out of love for you, when you observe these things about how Christ in flesh, the Lamb of God who is more than a lamb for the Old Testament sacrifices of the lambs, the goats, and so on, those couldn't take away sin, but this Lamb of God can. Why? Because He's God. He's God in flesh. And it is for this reason, as being perfectly man, he himself is without blemish. He is without blemish and therefore he can fulfill the law. The law's strict demands he can appease the righteous wrath of God. Only he, only the second person of the Holy Trinity, in, assumed with this human nature, only he could fulfill the law's demands. Only he could appease this wrath in your place. As your substitute. So when we reflect upon how out of love the Father sent the Son. And the Son out of love for the Father did these things. Out of love for you did these things. We can also reflect about how out of love the Father and the Son sends forth the Holy Spirit. Proceeds from them. Sends forth the Holy Spirit in time at Pentecost. And not just at Pentecost, but now, today, through His Word and through His Holy Sacraments. He sends forth His Holy Spirit in love to give to you certainty. To give to you the forgiveness of sins which was accomplished upon the cross by the shedding of Christ's blood. For where there is the forgiveness of sins, there is life and salvation. He delivers these things to you. He also delivers to you in love. This gift of sonship, as Paul was talking about in our epistle. He gives to us this gift of sonship. How? How does He give us this gift of sonship? It is in the waters of holy baptism. Where we are made anew. We are made a new creation. It's a lavish washing of the Holy Spirit. And this is what Nicodemus couldn't understand. It's what Jesus was teaching Nicodemus. This regeneration. This becoming anew. In the waters of holy baptism. And in holy baptism you are made a son, you are made a child of the Heavenly Father. Why? Because in holy baptism, you are baptized into Christ. It's like a GPS location sort of thing. Where are you, beloved Christian? You are in Christ. You are in the second person of the Holy Trinity. And being joined to Christ, being able to call Him your brother, you can call upon your Heavenly Father. 
That you have not only an earthly father, but you have a heavenly father. To whom you can petition. To whom you can ask. To whom you can pray to. You have a brother. You have a brother Christ who is the great high priest who continues to sit at the right hand of the Father, ruling all things for the sake of his church, ruling all things for the sake of you, as he continues to pray for you. As he continues to petition, petition his Father concerning you. So if you ever wonder what is God concerned with, what is he thinking about now, the answer is you. As he continues to pray for you. And you can look to your brother. You can look to your brother Christ and see how he suffered. You can see how he suffered and therefore you can take heart. That your high priest, yes he is king of kings and lords of lords, but he's not uninterested. He's not disconnected. He understands what it means to suffer. For he suffered. He suffered to win for us salvation. So he can sympathize. He knows how to comfort us. He knows how to strengthen us. And he does. He does in love as he sends forth his Holy Spirit. Through his word and his sacraments. Through the words of holy absolution. Whether publicly or privately. To put at ease our consciences. Our consciences which are oftentimes burdened with sin. We can cling to that forgiveness. We can cling to Christ's love because He so loved us that He laid down His life for us for there is no greater love than this. And one laid their life down for their friend. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.